Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I guess, <coughs> excuse me, I guess when you see Transport for London up there, you're thinking we're going to give you a, a conversation around the tube or around the underground or buses. But no, we're going to talk to you about the exciting, oh, we've got the sound now. We're going to talk to you about the exciting world of roadworks. <coughs> um, we, I work in a, in a part of the organisation called Road Space Management, and we are responsible for the Red Route networks across London. And what we've built and what we're going to show you today is an application we've got called London Works, which is all about potholes, roadworks, and how we coordinate works across the capital. So, and we're going to try and move this forward. So, any good TFL presentation is always going to start with a lot of stats. So, what I'm going to try and do for you here today is set, set, set the scene in terms of what it is we're trying to do. Um, London, I mean, London is growing, growing constantly. We're expecting the population to go up quite dramatically over the, the coming years. And more and more people are dependent on, on the road network. The road network, the road network within London carries, and you can see the stats there yourselves, 21 million daily trips a day are made on the network. We carry something like 6.5 million people on buses every day on the road network. The road network provides 90% of all the freight that's delivered in London. Huge amount of activity on the road network. Obviously, there's a huge amount of competition for space because underneath the road network, we have the utilities. We have the utility operations. Everybody wants gas. Everybody wants water. Everybody wants electricity. All of those networks are running underneath our road network across London. So people, there's a huge demand for space out there. And part of the challenge for us, and sorry, I've skipped forward. Smart, these are the roadworks. This is what we're talking about. I mean, I know, I know you've all seen them before, but this is what we're looking at. These lovely guys out digging up holes. People complain a lot about them. People think, ah, oh, they're not doing it fast enough. They're not doing it quick enough. Why are they going back there again? Who's doing it now? Who's digging it up? There are very valid reasons why we do roadworks, very good things that we have to do out there. And everybody depends across them. Um, now, here's a chap you all recognize, probably from the past, former, uh, uh, my former employer. And I'm putting him up there to, to, to signal something, which is that roadworks are there. They can become quite political. Back in 2010, Boris decided he was going to have a war on roadworks. Don't think we won it. I don't think we could even call it a draw. There are still roadworks out there. But these roadworks are essential. There's a lot of things going on under, underneath the ground. If people want gas, people want electricity, I said, that all has to happen on the back of roadworks. Everybody needs to dig it up. Plus, other authorities out there need to maintain the road network. So people walk along. There is no kind of trips on the, on the, on the pavements. You don't have potholes in the road. We've got to re-fetter the road to make sure it optimizes traffic movement. All of these things quite demand changes in the road network on a regular, regular basis and, a reg and, and constant maintenance of the whole thing. So, a few more stats. Half a million roadworks in London annually. And here we're talking about anything from a pothole repair all the way through to Crossrail, all the way through to the Victoria Station upgrade. Huge, very, very small works and huge works that go on for years. And each of them, each of them have the potential to cause lots of somebody somewhere problems. There are about over 100 different organizations across London who can dig up the road at any given time. So when you break it down into all the um, London boroughs, TfL, all the utility companies, each have a different role to play. And all of them are in competition. Oh, sorry, on the utility side, a lot of competition in terms of the marketplace. So a lot of people wanting to get access to the road space, getting access to what's underneath it to carry out repairs, to lay on new services. The 33 boroughs in, th in TfL are responsible for coordination of roadworks to minimize traffic disruption. That's one of our legal responsibilities. And so all of this is going on around things there's a lot of people working in boroughs and TfL trying to see when, when it should happen, how it should happen. We have, as with all things in life, we have one, we have one national specification out there, which means we have a way of transmitting conversations backwards and forwards between the boroughs, TfL, the utility companies, one form of language everybody uses and everything goes backwards and forwards. But we have quite a few different COTS products that interpret that specification and give us the output. So you've got lots of different stakeholders in this market doing lots of different things. The other thing that's in, in, in all of this is we have a huge amount 
of legislative and statutory responsibilities. So everything we do has got some piece of legislation standing behind it, it's got some regulation there saying why we should do it. And going back to my previous slide, talking about um, Boris, one of the constant, and, and, and the, his war on roadworks, one of the constant things that we do within the industry, and particularly from the political side, every time you, the phone rings and uh, you get a phone call from DFT and they ring up and say, ah, the Minister for Transport was stuck in traffic last week and he's come up with a brand new idea as how to deal with this, you think, oh no, not again. Because there's always going to be another piece of legislation, there's always going to be another way of dealing with it, and you say, well, we've thought about that before and we've got this. Or we've thought about it. Their ans the answer a lot of the time is more legislation, more responsibilities, more putting pressure on people to do things. So, in TFL, and I'm just going to flick through these bullet points because, uh, oops, I've gone too far. Well, I can practice. In TFL, we have a system called London Works. It was originally launched back in 2006. And what London Works did was it brought all of the sources of different sources of roadworks together into a single place. A revolutionary idea this was. This was really revolutionary. Prior to that, everybody worked in their own little silo, so each borough had its own record of everything that was going on. The utilities had their records of what was going on. TFL had their records of going on. What this gave us was one view of roadworks across London, which was essential when we, when we, when we were, for what we were trying to do. At the time, it was a brand leader. It, was, it, it really was a new way of doing things, really. I mean, in terms of <coughs> the way TFL works, we couldn't work without it. I mean, our network the f is... We've got 5% of London's network and we carry 30% of the traffic on our network. And our network is like a spider web that just spiders out across London through all the different boroughs. So for us to know what a borough is doing, for the borough to know what we are doing, it's essential. And back in 2006, this was the first time anybody actually visualized that on a screen in terms of graphically. So we, we, we launched this wonderful product. Everybody loved it at the time typical um, local government, technology moved on, we didn't keep pace. So we ended up with a very old, clunky system built on one technology that still works, it's still functional, still does what it needs to do, but it is very old, very clunky. People become unhappy with it because it doesn't do what, what it needs to do. It's not modern. It's not. So we decided that something needed to be done. This is a picture of a typical screen from London Works, the current one. As you can see, a lot of activity going on in London, lots of roadworks happening, and this is what a lot of people will be faced when they log into the, the system. This is what their, their screens look at. I mean, obviously that is probably a, a view to heighten the problem, but it is the view that they get. So, London Works 2, the new and improved version. So within TfL, we have a, a bigger transportation project called SITS, which is a Surface Transport Intelligence Systems. Actually, read that the other way around. Surface Intelligent Transport Systems. That's why I'm up here, to make these mistakes. And SITS, this is the SITS vision, um, which you can all, can all read. But for me, SITS is all about using technology better to be able to manage the networks better, bringing technology on board, taking the systems we've got, which are all based in different little silos around the business, in different parts of the, of, in different organizations. As I said earlier, we have information in, in all these different organizations outside of um, TFL. And SITS is about trying to bring that together into some common operational view, bring some sense to it, bring technology to bear on some of the problems we've got. So London Works 2 was chosen as the pathfinder for SITS. So, Obviously, when, when we looked at, at the whole SITS objectives, and we'll, we'll talk a lot more about SITS as we go through this, one of the big things we realized was look, roadworks, taking capacity out of the network, therefore having some visibility of them, having some way of managing them better. If you want to manage a network, you've got to know where your capacity has been taken away. It's as simple as that. So London Works was chosen as being the pathfinder for SITS. So this was quite a big thing in TFL, quite a big thing, because we have traditionally delivered software in a very kind of fixed waterfall way. We kind of go to people, we say, design us something, and then we come back. You've heard it all described as, as earlier, but we go to them, design us something, deliver it. Oh, we come back a year later, everything's moved on, and it's not what we wanted in the first place. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to work in a different way. So 
we had some fundamental principles that we wanted to carry out. We wanted to use COTS products. We wanted to be um, using COTS projects. We wanted to work closely with our delivery partners. We chose WSO2 and Esri to help us deliver this. And we wanted to work closely with them and make sure that we had a way of doing this. We also wanted to try out agile development. We, wanted to, we heard a lot of good stuff about it. We wanted to see actually how it worked. We wanted to learn from it. But one of the important things we wanted to do was to ensure that we had an open data capability at the end of this, that we didn't just build something that was there in isolation, that we had the ability to build on, on it. So I've talked a lot about it. So this is the solution, and the video's worked, which is good. So London Works 2. Basically, we've got three main suites within London Works 2. We've got something called Central Register, which is coming up now. So Central Register is really a data aggregator. It takes all the information in the different authorities around London and puts it into one place. So people can see what's, been planned to, what's going on today, what's been planned to happen in the future, what's, what's, what's going after, on after that. We've also got a system called T-Man. And I'm not going to keep time with this video, so you'll have to bear with me. We've also got a system called T-Man, which is a different kind of notice application thing, where if somebody wants to try and do significant changes to the, bur to the road network, somebody decides we need a roundabout instead of a crossroad, somebody decides we need a new bus lane in, in, in there. They, it's, it's not a question of just doing it. There's an, an authorization process that they have to go through, and T-Man facilitates that process. So we, it, it kind of allows people to propose, forward proposals, objections can be made, goes backwards and forwards until we come up with a solution that actually looks at the needs of all of the different um, users of the network. So it will take into account uh, drivers, pedestrians, cyclists, bus users. It takes into account all of those things and tries to bring it out. We've also introduced something called um, forward planning which again is key to what we want to do going forward. We want to know what's happening in two months' time. We want to know what's happening in six months' time. We want to know what's happening in five years' time. So we can start to bring these works together in a coordinated way. And that's what, this, what London Works 2 gives us. In terms of the journey, well, we, it's been a very interesting time for us because we have worked in a completely new way in terms of the traditional methodology in, 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 in TFL. We've had, to have, we've had a lot of barriers to overcome. We've had a lot of difficulties to kind of surmount. And the guys coming after me will, will talk you through more of those. But it has been a real challenge for us. But the important thing, I guess, is we, did, we delivered an MVP. We have a product. We delivered it to time and to budget, which is always a good story. We have shown it to the user base. And we have an enormous amount of interest from the user base. They're, they're very keen to get hold of this. We engage with them the whole way through on this because we want to make it for the users. The users have got to use this. They've got to be happy to use it. They're going to want to use it. So we spend a lot of time talking to them, get, getting user stories, understanding what the needs were. And of course, now we've made the mistake of showing it to them, and they're very, very keen to get hold of it to start working on it. So that's really good news for us. And we'll be going live in the next few weeks with this. So, just to run tr quickly run through some of the benefits that we, we've realized. <clears throat> the main trust of London Works, as I said, is to help people coordinate works across London to minimize disruption to traffic. So all you guys, everybody here who travels on, on the road network, there's pressure on us to kind of make those journeys as easy as possible, to make them as simple as possible, make them get people in and out, get more of those kind of working together, minimize disruption to the whole lot of you. So what we've done is we have created a system which allows people to easily share data. So we have access to something like 300 different data sets within the new system. We have allowed, we've set it up so they can share data internally and externally. We can build on the data coming in. Through all of this, we're improving what people see on the screen. We're improving operational awareness. We're trying to make more informed decisions about what it is that we're, what we're going to do on the road network. And we've also started to introduce things about life cycle management. So at the moment, we don't have a clear life cycle management from start of a thing all the way through to start of a plan all the way through to delivery on the ground. It's disjointed. We've started the work to pull all that together. And critically for us as well, we are seen as a success in terms of the Pathfinder in, in, in TFL. Agile, all the things we talked about are considered to be good. The way we've worked in partnership with WSO2 and with Esri considered to be good. It's the way forward for TFL is the, is, is the thinking. So where are we now? Well, 
We're about to launch, as I said, and I think that's key. And, and we're really excited about getting it out there. We're really excited to get, get it out to the user base. But we're not finished. We, 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 need, we realize we need to bring in new rules, new processes. We need to build new relationships. There's a whole heap of stuff that we still need to do. Roadworks is one element that affects people's journeys on the network. There are a lot of other things out there that we need to incorporate into the system to make it really, to fit it really into the SITS project, which is to, to help everybody move around. So we want to continue to develop. We've got new ideas. But we want to be the intelligent client, is how we're calling it. We want to be an intelligent client to, 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 to drive this forward. And I think on a personal note, from me, I mean, I've, I've been thinking about this, and on a personal note, it's going back to some of the earlier speakers, where, we, where I think we were told to think long and step short. Well, I've been working in this in industry for 25 years, and I started when some, my, my boss at the time came to me and handed me a big lump of legislation and said, there you go, you're starting in potholes next week. I thought it was something to do with the fact I was Irish, but obviously not. He then, I didn't read through it, didn't understand it, but the one thing we were agreed on was we needed a way to visualize all of these things, to make this work, to be able to coordinate works, to be able to understand what was going on. We needed to visualize them. We needed to get them on a map. We needed to do all those things. Sadly, it's taken us a long time to get there, 25 years. It's a long, long time. But we're in a really, really good place with London Works too. We've started, we've, we've moved up a stage. We've really revved it up from London Works 1. We've moved on a stage. So hopefully, the future is bright for us. Thank you. So, tough act to follow. Um, I, I've got two slides to talk about the architecture. Um, it has been mentioned, we've got a very clear business problem to solve, but we're also trying to do uh, a larger solution. Um, SITS is very much about bringing time and space together in terms of information and data so that we can see what we want to do, how it's going to impact the operation currently, the, predict the future, and then how we operate on the day. So we, we've done some planning, what's really going to happen, um, and then learn from what we've done. So the idea is that you'd bring together prediction, analytics, and calculating to drive learning. And underneath that, you're going to have a common kind of data platform. Where TFL has been, because of the nature of the organization, it's relatively young. Um, you know, it was created in two, about 2000 for the millennium. Um, everything, every system is a silo. And then we've got, you know, the, the classic kind of traditional IT. Let's write an FTP process to move data from system A to system B. Or let's let the business use a spreadsheet and copy the data around. So, so finding things is really difficult. Okay, first architecture slide. Um, the, the overall thing has been running for some time, so um, I've mentioned time and I've mentioned space, so obviously mapping and spatial work uh, was quite key to what we're doing. So that, pr that started ahead of um, things like London Works, uh, so we've been bringing all our data down to a, a common mapping base uh, for about three years now uh, under a sponsored initiative. Um, that's been quite successful. So in terms of this diagram, um, spatial. Now, I've mentioned the common data hub. So we have a very traditional IT hosting arrangement. Uh, we have our own data center. We're a transport company. We have a data center. Why? We're a transport company. So. Let's not use our own data centers. Let's think about using someone else's and just paying for it from OPEX. So we've moved to the cloud. Uh, we're seeing improvements in security and performance and the ability to do things a lot faster because we've decoupled from a lot of the traditional processes. Um, so TFL use both Azure and AWS. We went to AWS. Um, because we would get support from TFL Online. Um, just trying to figure out if I know how to use the pointer. There you are. So collaboration and innovation. Um, customers want to know uh, what's happening. TFL Online is a very well recognized, successful online presence for TFL. Um, behind the scenes, a lot of people do an awful lot of work to you know, claw the way to get data out of our line of business systems and then get it out to customers. The one really successful interface we have is the bus 
arrivals. So that if you're standing at a bus stop, you can look at a sign or use an app and it'll tell you when the next bus is going to arrive. The majority of our interfaces, people do quite a lot of work to take it from an operational system, rekey it to um, Google Maps or something like that, and then present it in a common and structured way. So this architecture is designed to start to unify the way we map everything so that we can then use integration and just start to publish to places like TFL Online. So over time, we will be able to get information out to the customer better. It will be the trusted information from operational systems, and it will be a lot more timely. Um, we also share a lot of data with people. London Works is very much about sharing Roadworks information. Um, we publish um, traffic performance information and, and you know, a large number of data sets. A leader in the kind of open data sharing. Um, that's all kind of planned to get slightly faster. It's publishing, you need editorial and approval processes, but we will get things out. Um, analytics and visualization. We do a lot of business intelligence today. Um, it, different part, TFL, large organizations, so within customer experience, we do a lot more analytics on tapping and pouts for Oyster. Um, but the operational business is very much currently today kind of do things, read the report from the, fo you know, the following day as to how we performed. So on Monday, we'll find out on Tuesday how we performed. Um, it, it's getting faster as people do things, but there hasn't been a consistency of uh, platforms. Um, and, you know, we still have this silo arrangement, okay, which we're trying to break down. And then data-driven operations and applications. So that represents London Works. Uh, we manage the road network, so we want to improve our understanding and situational awareness of what's happening on the road right now. Where are things going wrong? How do we get information out to sat-nav companies? Um, so that people are routed round incidents. That reduces the size of the incident. All this needs things to happen quickly and accurately so that people trust it. Um, we're not there yet. Uh, buses, I've mentioned the bus API. When we kind of started SITS, the priority for roads, who, who were the sponsor of SITS, was very much around um, keeping journey time reliable so that you would know it would take about 60 minutes to cross London. Um, so you could then make a choice and it should be 60 minutes almost, whatever the situation. Um, political organisation priorities change. So um, bus, bus passenger numbers have started to trend downwards. And so um, the priorities for road space management now are to get buses through junctions faster. Uh, and journey time reliability because we can't actually manage it just because of the amount of work, the amount of change and the uncontrolled demand on the network. M maybe it's something we can't manage, it's just going to get worse, but we want people to use the bus, so let's keep bus get buses through the road network as fast as we can. And so the, the, this needs to change and one of the points about trying to build a data hub and have everything together, you can then start to mash up at this point, almost any data set. And that way, you're, you're in the position of being able to become slightly more agile in terms of business responsiveness, rather than just, oh, we've got to create yet another FTP process to get some data out to then try and make a decision. Um, we have quite a lot large on-street operation, 600 people employed by TFL, not police officers, but they're doing checks, they're doing inspections. Um, uh, and monitoring things. Um, our outreach to them is not good and then we run quite a lot of tunnels and structures and again how do you, you know, at the moment if you look at the operations we, we manage incidents in a tunnel. Uh, both sides of the tunnel is connected to a road network so wouldn't you want to influence people arriving at the tunnel if it's blocked? Silos, um, really difficult. Uh, we worry about security, so we create the concept of a secure enclave. So we don't actually have very much personal information for road space management. We um, don't really deal with uh, people. We deal with journeys. Um, we have lots of magnetometers that 
just sense when a car's gone over the top. So we don't have very much secure data, but that was part of the architecture. Then the idea is we can get more and more kind of IoT type information coming in so that we can then ingest it, start to create insight from it, and publish it out to these systems. Um, just to mention here, um, we, we're now using uh, Waze as a data source, uh, and so crowd, crowdsource information is now being operationally used by TFL. Um, the kind of feedback from just doing something simple like that, which was easy because we had the integration in place, we were in the cloud, and we were starting to have the technology deployed, common platforms. So, you know, it took quite a short space of time and quite a small amount of money to then start to process ways, put it into an operational center. And the, the kind of business feedback is that this was a game changer. It, it's turned TFL's on-street operations from being reactive to proactive. Um, th this is before kind of some of the bigger analytics would come along and we start doing fusion between our own sensors, crowdsourced information, and in the future, you know, increasing information maybe coming from floating point sensors off cars. So it's, you, you kind of plan a, an architectural pattern you don't know quite where it's going to go in a large enterprise, but it gives you the opportunity to react, respond, and you know, help them do new things. Uh, serverless was probably, from a technical point of view, quite interesting, so we, we are trying to do this as serverless as possible, so the WSO2 platform is containerized. Um, we use Lambda quite a lot as well from AWS, um, all of which helps Although we still look at the uh, costs and sometimes wonder, but it should drive down the cost um, as it starts to scale up. Uh, and as been mentioned, we're very religious about trying to follow open standards, which is the only way you're going to get this kind of commodity. We can just mash things up. Uh, the UI is all HTML5, so we can run it on PCs, we can run it on tablets out on the street. Um, and we didn't follow Asanka's advice, so we have um, put single sign-on, but for this system, not for the entire operation. So the next slide is a slide of all the components we've used to build London Works. Um, so if you read the kind of WSO2 pr product catalog, we've probably used most of them. Um, there we go. Uh, so. We, because Streetworks is based on um, legislation, the data and the formatting of it is quite well understood. So to start off with, we simply took the existing schemas and moved that database instance to the cloud. Um, so then we would use data servers to connect to it. Um, we've got the ESB doing the, the grunt of orchestration of mediations and calling in business process um, and we're using analytics server for a few things um, so we mentioned the external community so we have electronic transfer of notices so these are people telling us about street works they're doing they come in um, it's currently processed through some java code so we've got the app server that gets put in the database we then bounce things around between the esri platform here which is doing all our spatial work and we process Eaton's and we use analytics server to look at does this roadworks conflict, roadworks request conflict with anything else and if it does we'll then raise alerts. So if it's, if it's hitting something in time and space we send an alert to, to users and that will get kind of prioritized to look at. We synchronize different things. Um, the user is HTML5 app um, so it's taking kind of forms processing from dashboard server up into uh, the browser, as well as anything to do with maps comes through the uh, GIS Esri platform so that we have integration between um, the maps and the forms. And effectively, there's a lot of JavaScript used on the client to integrate. If I draw a polygon on a map, it's then connected through to uh, the, the application data. Um, 
and we, we see this as very successful. The user experience and the user feedback has been uh, really good. Um, and we've been using things like SQS and lots of different Amazon services in order to make some of these uh, integrations straightforward. Um, so the, I think, intro for Alex, who, who's going to speak next, is I've kind of just given the frame of what we've used. Um, this is only successful if you change your traditional processes and do things in a different way. And that's what Alex will talk to us about. Thank you. Right. Afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Alex O'Brien. I work with Gerard O'Toole. Um, my role in TfL is, uh, I, I suppose, essentially a product manager. So just following on from what um, Sanjeev was saying earlier uh, about the uh, sort of the importance of the transition between business and technology, I think we're quite well placed um, to, to sort of effect some change there. So we've got, um, we, we are sort of basically in the middle with, between the two. So within my team, um, we, uh, we do some product development, but we also sort of improve products and we sort of um, make changes, sort of incremental changes. Uh, we also um, run a first line help desk as well. So we're quite sort of self-contained. Gerald's talked about the context of what we're trying to do and some of the challenges that we've got. And Roland's talked about the architecture that underpins the solution. And I'm here to sort of talk to you about our experiences in trying to do something different, which was really to build a new product or other platform using Agile. So we knew we needed to do something different because we'd had some bad experiences with the traditional ways of working. So uh, the way that was proposed to us was to use Scrum. And uh, when, we, uh, got, well, when we started this uh, project, I personally didn't know what Scrum was, so we did some uh, Googling, did some research, and we found that it had lots of interesting things like artifacts and ceremonies and Scrum Master and based on Fibonacci. And it was all quite strange and, and really quite intriguing. So we, we really sort of jumped in there and we, you know, uh, we, we, we ate it up really. General practice apparently is to start small and then build up to something big. But obviously we couldn't do that because we were building a platform, which was actually three applications and lots of other things. So it was quite a challenge. And, and we really sort of absorbed the, uh, the ethos of Scrum, I suppose. So, so we all got ourselves trained up. I was actually trained as a product owner two doors down uh, in this building. Um, so w we learned things quickly. And we started to do weekly sprint, um, yeah, one week sprints for about three months. And this sort of sums up uh, how we looked at the end of that. I think it was very intense uh, and extremely fun. And um, some of the great things that we saw about Scrum is the speed in which you can deliver things. So uh, as, as my role, as I suppose the sort of the senior product owner, we had a product owner who was sort of managing the sort of the basically the decision making. So I would sort of come in and, and see how things were going. And because we were using COTS and we were using uh, the cloud and we were combining uh, GIS technology and forms technology with WSO2, we could see things happening very quickly on a weekly basis. So that was really, really good to see. We brought the stakeholders along with us as well. So stakeholders in TFL were traditionally used to seeing things right at the end of the cycle and generally pretty unhappy with, with everything. So we had to sort of persuade them to come talk to us every week. And they didn't really want to do that, so we had to sort of force them. But then they came around to it because they could see that things were changing week by week. So, so we got some, some real interest from our user group that way to the point where they now understand Agile and they now expect you know, quite a lot out of us, which is quite uh, challenging and, and scary. Um, we made Agile a common word amongst our leadership as well. So London Works as a project was a pathfinder. So at the time, it, it wasn't really... Um, Excuse me. Uh, it wasn't really that well known in, in our, on our side of things in RSM, but uh, now I think the sort of the whole sort of approach of agile is <coughs> is much more of a, a common a commonality. It's much more expected that we should be delivering change incrementally and quickly. So that's a good thing. <coughs> um, yeah, we, we uh, had to get used to setbacks. I think uh, so. It was quite a challenge. So we we saw um, it quite a few sort of major problems that we had to overcome. So 
after a while we got quite used to it we got quite used to problem solving so um, I think that's just part of the sort of the agile process is that you need to be agile you need to be always thinking about how to overcome problems uh, so that was that was a good experience and uh, yeah the ability ability to bounce back as a as a team we, we worked quite well together so it was sort of quite a lot of camaraderie in that respect so that was cool Obviously, I mean, I don't need to tell you guys this, but from, from our side, we found that Agile was, was perfect for finding your way when you haven't got all the answers. Thinking about it, if we were to design an FRS to deliver London Works, it probably would have been about that thick and very wrong. So I don't think we really had any other choice but to use Agile. So that seemed to work very well for what we were trying to do. And again, just referring back to what Sanjeev was saying about making mistakes, very glad he said that because we did make a few <laughs> mistakes, um, but that was okay because we failed fast. So that system does work, and we found that we were able to get back on track when we did get things wrong. One thing that I've witnessed as a sort of a non-techie is that software development is very difficult and it is creative, and it's not a paint-by-numbers sequence. Um, I've sort of found that there's a rule uh, where if the business think it's that amount of effort, take that effort and times it by five, and that's probably the reality. So there's a bit of a synchronization to get the business in line with how long it actually takes to deliver good code. So I've seen sort of firsthand how challenging product design and development is. Um, so that's, that's something uh, that, that's, that's good that's come out of this. But yeah, I've spoken about challenges. There were quite a few <laughs> challenges that we needed to overcome. Um, simultaneous app development, so we had uh, three core applications and a user management module um, and uh, also a data loader and all on strate strategic platforms that were still being built that weren't really ready so we had to use lots of test environments and that was very challenging. Um, at the time there was no real widespread buy-in to Agile so it was all a bit of a, a test run, it was quite, um, yeah, felt a bit like a test pilot really. Um, I think there were people really sort of sitting back and waiting to see if it was successful. So hopefully we proved that it is. But um, yeah, there was a bit of um, scepticism, I think. We didn't really have a measure of uh, success in how we did Agile as well. So we, um, you know, we tried our best. I think we probably got it about 85% right, but we didn't get it perfect. And I think looking back, if we could have had some assistance, some coaching to help us through this uh, massive change in the way of working, that would have helped us out quite a lot. Deployment was a big challenge for us. So as, as I said, we, we designed the system, we, we built it, but because the environments weren't ready, we have now undergone a very lengthy period of deployment where we take everything and we try and put it on our strategic platforms. And that's been uh, very challenging and it's currently being managed by our partners in TFL Technology and Data. Uh, and they're, they're working hard to, to get it released and as Gerald said we're very close to getting it released. We're trying to do different things with supports. Uh, so we're, we're working out um, a new uh, arrangement with WSO2 where we can really, um, <coughs> in, instead of using very sort of penalty based heavy SLAs on getting support managed, uh, we're exploring ways of managing uh, defects and new features as part of the BAU workflow. So we're trying to maybe use some sort of a Kanban type approach to letting us control what kind of defects that we push through and sort of we, we maintain the prioritization of fixes and also new features. Um, and DevOps is something else that <coughs> we're very committed to trying to deliver. So we feel that being able to give customers new code every two weeks is quite reasonable. But uh, TFL, I think, um, has got some way to go before we get to that place. So we're sort of quite committed to delivering that, but I think there's a long way to go there. That is a big challenge for us. Another challenge is uh, how we manage finances and procurement. So finance and procurement perhaps see things in quite an old school way where you have a feature and they want to know when can I have it, how much is it going to cost? And we're suggesting actually maybe if you trust in the process, and that process has lots of value checkpoints along the way, um, and you can trust that that process is going to be delivered by people who know what they're doing, then perhaps you don't need that milestone sort of payment delivery method to, to make sure you're getting value for money. If you can trust the process will save you money and deliver good value, then perhaps that's a better way to work. So the business could possibly say, we've got this amount of money and we want to put it to good use. 
give it to the development team and they can then do the best that they can with it with the prioritization of what the users need. So, so that's something that we're trying to sort of get better at is to align ourselves with the, the finance and the commercials. In terms of the MVP that Joel spoke about earlier, we've used COTS and that was part of the reason that we could rapidly develop the product. But I think with that, um, we, we need to manage the expectations of the users. So I think we can expect there to be some turbulence in the early days when we go live because um, you know, it won't be perfect. There will be some issues to overcome and we've had some COTS-based restrictions. So as long as the users are, they trust that we can deliver change quickly, hopefully they'll, they'll stick with us. But if we don't get this rapid deployment DevOps style of working in place, then we're probably going to have a whole bunch of unhappy users. So, so that's, you know, we, we've committed to doing that. So that's, that's where we want to go with, uh, with, with that. But yeah, MVP, COTS, it, it gives you stuff quickly, but I think there are some, some prices that come along with that. We had an absolutely brilliant team. That, I should have renamed that um, how to run a successful agile uh, deployment. I mean, the first thing I would say is we had absolutely brilliant developers. So I would say um, thank you to WSO2 and Esri for providing consistently good developers. There was no exception to that. It was, it was a really good team. We had a very, really good uh, product owner, Matt Passato, uh, very focused on uh, not only delivering what the business needed, but really understood the process of agile as well. Um, and our Scrum Master was also very good. He was um, sort of, I, I guess I would equate him sort of a Jedi sort of level. He was, he was really sort of very good at getting people to feel like they came up with the answers, perhaps when he was sort of guiding them to the right answer. Um, so he was uh, instrumental, I think, in, in making this work. Um, in terms of technical leadership, I think Roland, who spoke just before me, was, was key to helping us to get to this place because he sort of opened our eyes to some of the potential things that were out there, some of the different ways of working that perhaps our internal um, technology providers weren't ready to give us yet. So it, he sort of helped us to become that intelligent client. But also you had, um, uh, from the supplier's side, you had um, people like Seneca and Rob uh, Ackroyd from Esri who were very able and capable of working out the solutions uh, within uh, the, the architecture that we were working in. So, so that, was, that, was, that was great. We couldn't have done it without them. And, uh, and we also had senior management buy-in from higher-ups. So again, none of this could have happened if we didn't have the support of the senior leaders like Gerard, uh, Mark Whitaker, and Glyn Barton, because you know, they, they really sort of bought into what we were trying to do. So we had a lot of challenges. We went into the board meeting. A lot of time we had bad news, and, and nobody got beaten up. Everyone was always supported. They always had our backs. So, so that was good. So all of those things are the sort of conditions for success for an agile transformation, I'd say. And, and the last thing I'll say about this, if, uh, if anybody is yet to embark on an agile journey, don't cut corners because we've also seen that when you do that, you, you call it Scrum, you call it Agile, but then you sort of just make up your own version of it. Unless you really know what you're doing, you probably are going to get suboptimal results. So that would be the message that I would as a lesson learned to senior management, make sure you resource it properly. Um, we, we spoke earlier about mindset adjustment, and that, that's something that we've been thinking about a lot as well. It sort of comes down to the difference between iterative and, and uh, sequential, you know, waterfall, agile, and I know you probably know this better than I do, but um, it, it really strikes me that iterative is the only real way that you can support innovation. So it's very difficult to run an innov innovation project through the traditional ways of working. And we need to try and get TFL thinking more along those lines. It's OK to not know what you need from day one. That's one of the messages that we're trying to get across to some of the, the people on the business and technology side in TFL. And Agile is really about talking to people. Uh, we found, you know, it's, it's about getting people on side and, you know, we can learn the process and, and deliver that process perfectly. But, you know, delivery is more than just our team. You know, it's, it's the whole kind of machine. So, so we need to talk to people to make sure that they're in line with what we want to do. And the reason I like Agile is because it's, I, I find it to be pro-customer. 
that's how I'd sort of phrase it. It's, it's not a problem if, if you realise that you, you've changed your mind as, as the customer, that the business requirements have changed. You shouldn't be punished for that. You shouldn't be given that glare from the project manager. You know, it's, it's okay to ask for things late in the day. And I'd, I'd say as well from a developer's point of view, um, if scope changes late in the day, <clears throat> it should be seen as an opportunity to do things better for the business, a way to sort of squeeze more value out for the business. might not always be possible, but it's something that I, I think you know, developers have to come along with the, sort of the concept of Agile as well as the business, so we're all involved really. I just want to sort of wrap this up by quoting uh, a few uh, words from one of my favourite authors at the moment, uh, Lisa Adkins, who talks a bit about, um, uh, in, in this part, about the, the differences between the sort of command and control mindset and the agile mindset. So you may not agree with some of these things, but I thought that they were quite interesting and they sort of resonated with me. So the, uh, the first one is, from a command and control point of view, scope can be locked down with later discoveries being handled as change requests against the scheduled end date, and Agile would suggest that scope remains flexible and changes of any kind are welcomed even late in the project. So, you know, that's a typical example of the type of message that we're trying to get across to other parts of the business. Uh, the second one, uh, one of my old managers used to say this quite a lot, we can plan the work and work the plan, whereas Agile would suggest planning is essential, plans are useless which is quite harsh and some people may not agree with that and I, I might be tempted to say that uh, the value is in the planning more than the plan itself. And the last one is uh, delivering on time within budget and on scope equals success and Agile would suggest that clients getting the business value they need is the only measure of success and, and that hits home for me having dealt with lots of project managers and I've got nothing against project managers at all but um, it comes down to, is the customer getting what they want? That's really all that matters. So for us now, uh, our next steps, I think we, we're much more confident in delivering uh, products in this method, and we're building out a roadmap to deliver more value to London's users. Uh, we've got some projects lined up already with WSO2, so we're, we're planning to build out the, uh, the application uh, platform. Uh, all within the sort of the remit of managing road space. Um, we're now able to assist with other teams and projects who want to do similar things to what we've done. So that's, I find that personally very rewarding. And to, to end on a sort of a humble note, um, you know, I'm, I, I know a bit about Agile now, but I also know that there's a lot more that I don't know about how to do things well. So um, I can see that there's a long journey ahead of us in our team and, and in TFL in terms of really reaching that level of agility that we want. So, you know, for me, I'm, I'm not particularly wedded to any delivery method. As, as the business, it's all about value. And if it's waterfall, if it's agile, if it's any version of agile, it, it doesn't really matter. It's about, is it giving us what we need for the best price? So um, I, I like agile a lot, and so far it's worked very well for us. Um, so, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.